how small a thought it takes to fill a whole life. Steve Reich has an inherent interest in in rhythm music. Um, a lot of European classical concerns are about harmony and melody, and and ideas of rhythm come more from uh, certainly Africa. And and for him to be so interested in that aspect of music making in the context of being a composer uh, really distinguished him, really set him apart from a lot of his contemporaries. In a way, that kind of puts him in line with more sort of rock and roll tendencies and the idea of like rhythm music and and uh, whether he knows it or not I mean that he's kind of he's, he's kind of a, a rock and roller <laughs> See, I was born in 36. I'm a cusp generation. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a, a young beatnik and elderly hippie, but closer to the beatnik generation, I guess. <laughs> no, I grew up listening to, you know, uh, Beethoven Fifth, Schubert Unfinished, but also, you know, the Hit Parade and uh, Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra and all music of the 40s and 50s. Uh, and then when I was at Juilliard, uh, I, uh, this is like, uh, you know, 61, 62, I started hearing Coltrane. Um, I remember, I got really uh, into the album uh, Africa Brass, which is referencing um, African musical ideas. I, I had been as a graduate student down to uh, Ojai, which is a little town north of LA, and uh, Gunther Schiller was down there, and uh, he was talking about his history of early jazz, and he said, uh, "I've discovered this book of." Notations of African music, the first book of accurate. And I said, you know, excuse me, what's the name of the book? And he said, Studies in African Music by A.M. Jones. And I went back to the Berkeley Library and took it out, and it was like looking at something from another planet. You know, mm -hmm. I'd heard African music, I knew it swung, and it was great, but I had no idea how anybody was doing it. So to see repeating patterns in what we would call some subdivision of 12, you know, patterns of three, patterns of four, patterns of six, laid on top of each other so their downbeats do not coincide. Uh, that was really a, a, a shocker. And the things that I was doing on tape, I began to sort of, you know, sort of see analogies, kind of like, what have I got here, mechanized Africans? You know, I bought I, the record this. drumming um, because it just was really, it was really minimal. And it was the cover just sort of said drumming. And like, you know, it was like, it, was, it wasn't this, this flashy thing. It was this other thing that was really stark. And it really appealed to me on an aesthetic level, just the starkness. And, um, and that's the first thing I heard. And there was nothing really like it, you know. And there, was nothing, I, there was nothing in my record collection like it at all. So it kind of opened up this whole door. So Percussion is a group that's been around, I don't know how long now, I guess it's getting on to 10 years. I can't remember when I first ran into them. It might have been up at Yale where they came out of, uh, got a teacher by the name of Bob Van Sice. We got together at grad school. We were like very much, you know, studying classical music. Four of us met there and it was like, I don't know, playing some pretty serious stuff, but our second year there I was like, man, let's tackle drumming. It's a really wonderful piece of music. So we just spent a lot of time in a room figuring out how to, I don't know, make those rhythms lock in, you know, pretty seriously, dealing with phasing, um, you know, taking two rhythms and kind of tearing them apart gradually. Um, so we just spent a lot of time with it. So I guess in that way, it was somehow a basis of what we do. And I think kind of moving on from it, the original work we do is, I think, very influenced by and where Reich is coming from. I think like pretty much a lot of people working today is, you know, influenced by where he was coming from. Well, you know, I was a drummer when I was 14 and uh, I was doing these very rhythmic pieces. I was drumming on the keyboard, actually an electric organ, very percussive and it worked. Somebody made a crack and said, man, you know, if you're going to drum on the keyboard, why don't you drum on the drums? And I kind of thought, you know, boing, you know, you got a point there.
the idea of phasing arose almost by chance. I made a recording of myself playing this pattern, this piano pattern. I made a tape loop on it, put it on a tape recorder, sat down at the piano, said, okay, here we go, you know. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm not as perfect as a tape recorder, but A, I can do it, and B, doing it really feels great. And this whole process that goes through a lot of irrational relationships and then hits something that you really can hear as music and then goes irrational again and then comes back into something that's musical was very powerful. And I said, that's, that's a way, to, you know, this is a way of making a piece. And I know what I have to do. I mean, I have to move from unison as slowly as I can up one sixteenth note ahead of the tape. And doing that is kind of like a meditation. It's, it's not improvising. You know exactly what you're going to do. But your psychology is totally listening. You're just locked into the sound. first real exposure was when I was in school, when I was in music school, um, and I heard some of his music, I heard Music for 18 Musicians. The first piece of his I actually ever played was Nagoya Marimba. I think it was realizing that a guy had written music for drummers, first of all, like that was already exciting, and then uh, music that was all about groove, pulse, rhythm, interlocking rhythm, all of those kind of things. I think that um, in a lot of classical music, maybe we don't get so much of a chance to do that. You know, a lot of times percussion and orchestra and classical music, you're putting a little accent on something or some color on something. But this was a guy who went to Africa where people were making entire pieces just out of percussion and saying, okay, this can be done. big 70th birthday thing and really you know the best possible present was to find out that there were all these musicians like in Latvia or Seoul Korea who could really you know play music for 18 musicians or uh, music from allied instruments or music for pieces of wood and really play it uh, even though I never met them they never heard my ensemble but they did hear records and their teachers taught it to them because younger people now have grown up hearing it last night and played New York counterpart the Carnatic. I thought she played beautifully. And uh, I met her afterwards, you know, how do you do, you know, I didn't know her, I didn't know her at all. She's from San Antonio. And uh, I can't tell you, you know, how, how satisfactory that is. I've always been really drawn to this piece because it's just, there's so many colors, so many beautiful things that he does just with this continual sound and how there's the shift and, and the different uh, rhythms change and, and allow the music to grow through 11 different instruments. It's really a neat piece. So this is my first chance out, and the first time you play it to actually play it for the composer. I mean, wow, it was it was really nice. He he came up and said he enjoyed it, so that meant a huge amount. Pat Metheny tape sounds beautiful and it's the greatest thing. It's the greatest thing. There's uh, a level of trust to where you can just swim on top of it. Fantastic.
classical music has such an anti-visual <laughs> interest. You know, just, I guess, being conscious of the fact that people want to see shit happen. They don't just want to listen to stuff. You know, it's like, if I go to see music, you know, I'm going to see music. I'm going to see a band play. Now, their take on Pieces of Wood was literally, you know, taking the title literally. I, I wrote it for claves, which are instruments, you know. I mean, they're just, just cylindrical pieces of wood. There are, um, you know, Latin percussion and other companies make them. You can buy them. You can tune them with a the power sander, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they literally went to the lumber yard. I think they got mahogany and put handles on it and got these ferocious wooden uh, mallets to play them with. And then they got this idea to present the piece very dramatically. Now they're young, they're, they're you know, really hot, and they play with a lot of energy at an ear-splitting level. I mean, I hope they're all wearing earplugs because that piece can really, really lay waste to your, your, your hair cells. But, I mean, it was a fantastic performance, and they tend to always deliver. He's always been so nice, so supportive of us, really excited about people taking on his music and, and, and championing it. I think in the early part of his career, I think, um, you know, he, he formed a group to play his music because I think people didn't get what was going on when he was first doing it, you know. And it's been around for a while now, and it's more a part of the culture, and people get really excited about it. And, he, and of course, I mean, how rewarding must that be? You work your whole life at something you really believe in, a lot of people along the way tell you, I don't, you know, I don't know what you're doing, this is kind of weird or whatever. And then you see this like explosion of interest in your music and stuff. It must be really cool. I could, you know, Hanson's going to be here. <laughs>